1 John chapter 3 and verse 19. I just want to show you this, and then I'm going to kind of bounce, and then I'm going to, I'm going to jump over and say a couple things from the book of Job, and then maybe, maybe something from Romans. And Here's my primary note page. It's got a lot of scriptures, and the ones that got dots by it, I might go to. <laughs> They're just, it's just overwhelming. Amen? The Holy Spirit is overwhelming, and the Word of God is overwhelming. I literally get overwhelmed, and I'm not kidding. I was, I've been taking... I've been taking notes. All, I just write all the time. And then I try to organize it and then I have to walk away from it. Because you know what that is? That's the Holy Ghost. He's way bigger than my, my, this brain right here. Amen. The mind of Christ is in my spirit. But, but you know, when this mind tries to capture all the things that God's uh, trying to give me and to give you, that I believe will really help you. I believe this message will really help you if you really get a hold of this. Amen? So let's look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 19. And by this... We know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Just leave that up there for a couple minutes. You know we must assure our hearts. Many times we're trying to believe things that, and we're saying things with our mouth, but we've never assured our hearts. And you know assuring your heart is a process? Do you know that it's natural to disbelieve God and to be full of condemnation? You know it's easier if you say, oh, I just naturally believe God. No, you don't. No, you don't. It takes effort to assure your heart. Now, I, I put this up here, and I want to say a few things here. We're going we're to come back here as I try to pull all these loose ends together. Um, we are spirit, soul, and body. We've talked about that. The chart that Emerson made is up here. We are spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. But your heart is different from your spirit. Your heart, when we talk about your heart, we're not talking about your physical heart. We're talking about your inner man. You better get, this is powerful. I know some people teach that your heart and your spirit are the same thing, but I can give you a thousand scripture verses that'll disprove that. Your heart and spirit are different. Well, what is your heart? I thought we were spirit, soul, and body. You, I believe your heart is your entire inner man. I've heard one definition that I totally love. Your heart is the place where who you are in the spirit and who you are in your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions come together. That's your heart. Amen? Amen. Do you know your heart can condemn you? Do you know why we don't have confidence in the things of God? Because our heart's condemning us. Amen. Our heart's telling us, well, you haven't prayed enough. You haven't done this enough. I mean, you're not, you know, you know Benny Rooster. How can you expect to pray for somebody and see him get healed? That's a joke. Thought some, some, Brett caught it. Thanks, Brett. Good to see you, by the way. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. And see, and that's our heart condemning us. Amen. Let me, let me just say a couple things. I'm going I'm to get in, into this more. Your spirit is the part of you that when you said yes to Jesus, your spirit became completely born again, sealed, vacuum packed. It'll never change. Amen. That's who you are in the spirit. But your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, where your mind is at, needs to be renewed. Which is, it, 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 it's... It, your spirit, your heart, is your entire inner man. It's where your soul, who you are in the soul, either agrees with your spirit or it agrees with your physical body. I used to wonder why it seemed like there's people that aren't born again, but they seem like they have a good heart. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? That's where the unregenerate heart, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That's the unregenerate heart where people can be nice people, but if they're, if they're not born again, who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? Amen? Who wants to not receive all that God is? I mean, you have to be born again. You must be born again. But, even, but once you're born again, your heart, you still, whatever you treasure is where your heart will go. That's right. When you put a value on the things of God, guess where your heart's going to go? You have to assure your heart. If you don't assure your heart, your heart will be condemning you. When you go to pray, they, and this is a fight. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, that we're fight the good fight of faith, not the good fight for faith. Can you hear the difference? It's a fight, and we're not fighting the devil because the devil's defeated, but we're fighting all the unbelief and all the condemnation that our heart has thrown upon us. Through the years, you know your heart doesn't know what to believe? It only believes what you tell it to believe. Amen. Amen. See, this is the fight. I made a decision recently. I am going hog wild in meditating the things of God 
and, and just, I am going to, re, everything that he has made available, I am saying yes to. But it is a fight. You know what it's a fight with? It's a fight with all of the wrong mindsets. That's why I tell people, I could care less if anybody comes to that healing school. But you're the one that loses out. God loves you. But you've you got to hear this stuff and hear it and then hear it again and then hear it. And all of a sudden, I, anymore I get to stuff I can't even go very far because the Lord just starts speaking. All these verses are going off and all these things are going off in me. And see, and what it comes down to is my, I get it, getting to the place where my heart's no longer condemning me. Amen? Now, now let's, let, I'll tell you what, back up to verse 14 and we'll get a running start into this. Amen. Say amen. amen. <laughs> okay. All right. We know that we have passed from death to life because we go to church. <laughs> we know that we've passed from death to life because we said a prayer one time. We know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. How do you know? Because you love the brethren. We know, now I know there's carnal Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about that. They're born again, but they're not, obviously they're not abiding in who they are. And nobody does this perfectly. I'm not saying that. And this isn't something you do to be. This is who you are if you're born again. Amen. You've already passed from death to life and this is what it looks like. This is the gist of the book of 1 John. Did you know that? The, the, the gist of the book of 1 John is that if you're a believer, it ought to show up somewhere. Amen? Amen? If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence to convict me? Amen? All right. So there's how we know we've passed from death to life. Why? Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Next verse. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Oh, come on. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. It's inconsistent with having that hatred in my heart with the life of Christ abiding in me. It's inconsistent. Next verse. We're, we're really after something here. Watch. By this we know we, we love because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Next verse. But whoso has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his bowels, from him, how does the love of God abide in him? In other words, if you see somebody in need, you have the ability to help them, right? I'm not talking about foolishness. Please. See, so many people hear these verses and they get condemned. We need to be led of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will tell you when it's a legitimate need and when it's not. Amen? Amen? That's so important to remember that. But if you see, and it's not just material stuff. You know what people need? They need the Word of God. That's why I prod and I urge and I provoke and I, I, I try to stimulate and I prod and I core just, just a few inches shy of coercing to try to get people to hear this. Every, every Sunday, not just Sunday, seven days a week, constantly feed on the word, CDs, whatever it takes to hear. the. You know, I'm meditating right now and you've already got it, so quit trying to get it. And I'm over and over and I listen to it and the positive ministry of the Holy Spirit and I'm meditating on these things and thinking about them. Yeah, that's why I love to jog so much anymore because I put in a teaching CD and I jog and I meditate and I come back and I write. It's just so good. So good. But see, you can't get this with just, well, I got it. I'm good. You've already got it positionally, but you've got to assure your heart. You've got to come out of heart condemnation. All of us are sin conscious. Until we become righteousness conscious. Now watch this. But who, uh, next verse. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now here's what we're after. Next verse. And by this we know that we are of the truth. In other words, when we see the, rea we, when we see the fruit in our life, we know we're of the truth. And this is, helps assure our hearts before God. We need to assure our hearts before God. Because if we don't, our heart will condemn us. We'll go to pray and we won't have any confidence. Why? Because our heart's condemning us. Every time I pray and I don't have confidence, it's because my heart's condemning me. Are you hearing? Amen. Next verse. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. In other words, if your heart's condemning you, God still loves you. So your heart can be condemning you. God's not doing that. Amen. See, this is why so many people, it's so easy. 
why preachers will control people many times, whether intentional or unintentional. I don't know. That's between them and God. But they, they put stuff on them to try to control them because so many people relate to condemnation. I'll say it again. Condemnation is natural. It's natural. Condemnation is natural. It's easy to be condemned because we just we naturally gravitate towards that. To walk in a righteousness consciousness is supernatural. Amen? It takes the Holy Spirit to help you do these things. I love, I love, I heard Andrew Womack say something so good. People hear these testimonies of how I've seen people raised from the dead and all those kind of things. And they think, wow. He goes, but it took me 20 years of meditating the scriptures and meditating on the word and dreaming and seeing God raise people from the dead through me before I ever saw any manifestation like that. Are you hearing? Amen. Why? Because our hearts are condemning us many times. Next verse. This is, a, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. If your heart's not condemning you, you have confidence toward God. This is where your heart has to be trained. Now, I want to say something here. I want to say something here. Jump over to Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. I want to show you, this is where the new birth is prophesied. Everybody say, new birth is prophesied. New birth prophesied. There's, there's others, Ezekiel eleven nineteen 19, etc. But 36, 26, watch this. Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out the heart of stone out of you, uh, or take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh or a heart that's pliable. Now stop. What's the difference? Your spirit is the part of you that's sealed. When you accept Jesus, it's done. But your heart's the part of you. That's when he says, I'll give you a new heart. What is that heart? It's a heart. It, it, it now, because it's a new heart, it has the capacity. Say capacity. capacity. To receive what has become a reality in the spirit. All right. All right. You got that? Your new heart, if you're born again, you, your spirit, has been, he that has joined the Lord is one spirit. It's been raised up, seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. And now your heart your entire inner me, which includes your soulish realm, it now has the capacity, say capacity, capacity, to receive what you are in the Spirit. You hear that? See, we need to know that because there's a lot of confusion. I, I wrote down a whole, whole bunch of scriptures here about the heart. And, and I said, Do you know, and here's how we know that, that the Spirit, soul, and body, and heart, that your three-part being, because they're different Greek words and they're different Hebrew words. They're different words. See, when you say something, that's why the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, that where your treasure is, there will your heart go. Whatever you value, that's where your heart's going to go. Amen? And let me tell you something. People that are born again, you ever see people that are born again, but they, they don't care very much about the things of God? Do you know why? Because they're constantly siding with this. They're letting their heart their, side with the soulish realm or what, what the physical realm in the body, but they're not siding with the spirit. You know what a good heart is for a believer? You know what a good heart is for a believer? It's a, a heart that says, I'm constantly going to go with who God says I am. I'm after the things of God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, it says, Take heed, be careful lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What is an evil heart? An evil heart that says, nah, I'm just going to go with the things here in the natural. I don't want to get too radical. I don't want to get too into the things of God. Why not? <laughs> Why not go all the way? You know how short our time on this planet is? Very short. But see, you can decide. But once again, it, all, it comes back to we must assure our heart. If we do not assure our heart, guess what? We have a condemned heart. And a condemned heart is what the scripture also calls an evil conscience. An evil conscience. Now let me, let me, let me share some things with you. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. No, no. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. We'll go, with Hebrews, we'll go there first. Hallelujah. Glory be to God forever and ever and ever. I'll try to get some of these because they're so good. Glory to be. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now think about that. 
Do we really have boldness when we approach Him? Do we really have boldness in our relationship with the Lord? All right. All right. Amen? All right. You know why? It's only by the blood of Jesus. Right. It's only by the blood of Jesus that we approach Him in prayer or in anything. That's right. So having boldness, that's, notice that's not arrogance, it's boldness. Uh, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Next verse. By new and living way. Ever say new and living. New and living. That's what Jesus is. That's what he's done. It's a new and living way. It's not an old and a dead way. Amen. Amen. I want to say some things right here. You know what? We need to tell our kids. We can help form our kids' hearts. Do you know that? Right. So we think, oh, no, they got to do this. And then we let the world form their hearts. Right. You form them. Right. You can form their hearts. Right. Hallelujah. 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 By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. Next verse. And having an high priest over the house of God. Watch this. That's referring to Jesus. Let us draw near. Let us draw near. With a true heart. With a true heart. With a true heart. In full assurance of faith. Do you know what it says in 1 John 3, 19 that we're to assure our hearts? It means confidence. It means giving our heart confidence, assurance. We can draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, watch this, from an evil conscience. What's an evil conscience? It's the part of your heart that's condemning you. See, when you try to approach on any other basis other than what Christ has done, your conscience will condemn you. He was like, well, I can't pray. I haven't been reading my Bible enough. I haven't been doing this enough. What's it got to do with you? You're not a chain in the link. A chain's only as strong as its weakest link. If you put yourself as a link in the chain, guess what? You're not a link in the chain. He took you out of the equation. And if you think you're a link in the chain, it produces an evil conscience. What's that? It's a heart that condemns you. And tells you, who do you think you are to pray? Who do you think you are to give Ryan a word of knowledge? Who do you think? See, I deal with that stuff, but I recognize it now as an evil heart. You too. Having boldness. What does that mean? I thought he was having boldness to approach God based on the blood of Jesus, based on what he's done. But see, you've got to assure your heart. You've got to constantly tell your heart. It's not about me. I'm not a chain in the link. It's about what he did. If you don't, you will be condemned. Oh, say, I'm not condemned. I can just sin like crazy. <laughs> you're condemned if you're sinning like crazy. See, that's what we think sometimes. But do you have confidence? Do you have confidence? Do you have confidence that God's going to meet all your needs and take care of you? Do you have confidence or you spend your nights worrying, staying up late trying to figure this out and figure that out? Or do you have confidence? I love when my wife prayed for Reese one time when he had these warts on her hands. She said it was just amazing. I had to, on his feet, on his feet I'm sorry. When he, he, I thought she was going to have to take him to a doctor and get all this stuff removed. And she goes, one thing, she goes, I prayed about it and then I forgot about it. And all of a sudden the warts were gone. Uh, that's, it, that's, it. that's powerful. But see, sometimes, what is that? Her heart was assured in that area. See, this, this is the fight of faith. You know when the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 12, we're to fight the good fight of faith. I told you earlier, it's the fight of faith, not for faith. You've already got it. Amen. But it's a fight. And in the Greek, those words fight are where we get our English word agony. Nothing out here is telling you to believe God. Why do we share all those testimonies? Oh, Chris, that took a lot of time. I'm going to be late for my football game. The football season starts this fall. You got time. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. You know why? Because that encourages you. We need, I need to hear that. I was, uh, uh, I listened to a healing testimony this week uh, and, and I, right after I got done listening to it, I started talking to a guy that was doing the, dealing with these different things and stuff like that. And I remember talking to him and thinking, that's a piece of cake for Jesus. This is no problem. Just believe the Lord. I was thinking like that. You know why? Because I had just been feeding on a testimony that was encouraging me, believe God. We think, oh, that's weird. No, let me tell you what's weird. The world's weird. They're the ones that are dying early and sick. We're not the weird ones. They are. Amen. Praise God. Let us draw near. Let us. Let us. God's produce. Let us. <laughs> Let us draw near 
with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I believe it translates into your walk. Next verse, one more verse. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who, is, he who promised is faithful. In other words, let us hold fast that confession of hope. Let us hold fast the blood of Jesus. That confession that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus has done. Now I want to use my wife as an example again. She's been battling these allergies. That does not make God not a healer. God's already provided healing for that. But I just tip my hat to her because she's not rolling over and taking it. She's fighting. And she's saying, this is not God. Well, I tried that one time and it just didn't work. I don't care if you try to, listen, if you, if you pray for 100 people and they all die, it may be the 101st person you pray for that receives. Amen. We got to step out of the boat. Christianity is not just about a religious social club where we try to outdo the church down the road with our events because they're better than your events. No, Christianity is about the power of God being in manifestation 24-7. Throughout the week, I love when I hear that. I said, I ain't taking this. You know the common denominator in people that receive? They receive, they believe it, and they act on it. But you can't get that until you assure your heart that your Redeemer lives, Job said. But Job was crying out for where you and I live. Your Redeemer lives. He lives in you. Hallelujah. That's why Job said in Job 3.25, the thing that I've greatly feared has come upon me. Why did he fear it? Because he didn't have a Redeemer like you and I do. He didn't have a finished work to look to like you and I do. Hallelujah. Go jump over to uh, Hebrews 9, 14. Watch this. Oh, I'll tell you what. Back up to verse 13, please. This is all good. He's talking about under the old covenant. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Watch this. Next verse. How much more? Talking about the Old Testament sacrificial system. If that worked under the Old Covenant, how much more under the New Covenant? There you go. Amen. How much more? Say, how much more? How much more? Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience, cleanse your conscience, the part of your heart that condemns you, needs cleansing consistently, just as you walk through this world, you pick up the dirt of unbelief. Did you know that? Walking through life. I tell people all the time, turn on the news and you'll be suicidal after a couple news broadcasts. Because all the negative things on the news and then all the commercials about what you might have, if those don't kill you. See, that's, you see we, some of us feed on that. We feed on that death consistently. I'm not saying don't be informed, but I'm saying when we feed on it, it'll have a, an effect on your life. That's right. That's right. You are what you eat. You you and if you're consuming that stuff, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from what? From sin. Oh, no. Sure, don't say sin. It says dead works. Wow. It doesn't even say cleanse your conscience from sin. See, that shows how we think. See, we think the Holy Spirit is like, he's just beat. Oh, I'll tell you what. What if, what if uh, you know, the Bible says he, he's a comforter. But most of us think he's the one that's pointing out all of our faults. Right? What if, what if me and you hung out as friends and, and, and everything you did, I said, ah, Emerson, nope, that's wrong. That's wrong. And then we went somewhere. And I could read his thoughts. Ah, ah, not a good thought. Not a good thought. Hey, oh, what are you thinking? You need to be nice. And I was always pointing out his faults. Do you think he'd want to hang out with me? No. But that's how we view the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. That's right. We think the Holy Spirit's the one that gets on your case. That's not the Holy Spirit's ministry at all. How could it be to your advantage for Jesus to leave, for Jesus to physically leave, and the Holy Spirit to come if He's just getting on your case. He's not getting on your case. He's pointing out that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
But you know what's getting on your case? An evil conscience. A conscience that has not applied the blood of Jesus and realized that that's an evil conscience. An evil conscience that it's a heart that condemns me that's not full of assurance because it's trusting in me and not in him. Watch this. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, cleanse your conscience, not from sin, but from dead works, so you can now serve the living God? Most people serve out of condemnation and not out of a pure, uh, a cleansed uh, conscience. Oh, we need people to do this. And if you don't do it, you might not go to heaven. <laughs> Amen? Let me say it to you this way. Most people, many times, use condemnation to get people to give financially. They use the curse of the law to get people to give financially. Now, I believe in giving, I, but I believe in get. You're already blessed. End of story. Jesus did it. But listen to me. Giving is an act of faith. And if you don't give, once again, faith has a corresponding action. If you really believe you're blessed, you'll be a giver. If you're not a giver, you won't. You don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, you don't receive it, even though it's all yours. That was good. <laughs> did you hear that? You're already blessed. You don't give to get. Amen or oh me. <laughs> you don't give to get. You're already blessed. And if you believe it, you'll give. If you don't believe it, you won't. And if you don't, you won't. <laughs> I like what my wife says. She goes, we don't know how much we don't know. <laughs> That's a good line. Jennifer Barhorse. <laughs> it's the truth. How much more shall the blood of Jesus... He offered himself without spot to God. Cleanse your conscience, not from sin, but from dead works. Once your conscience has been cleansed from dead works, you're able to serve the living God. The Lord gave me a definition of dead works. Here's what dead works are. You ready? Works you offer up as payment for sin or shortcomings in order to receive blessing from God. Those are dead works. You're not redeemed from works. You're redeemed from dead works. There's a big difference. I'm going to say that again, so fear not. You're ordained to good works, Ephesians 2.10. God's redeemed, uh, uh, created a people, redeemed a people unto himself, zealous of good works, Titus chapter 2, I believe that's verse 14. Zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. That's who we are. But a dead work is, well, I love this. Works you offer up as a payment for sins or shortcomings in order to receive blessing from God. In order to receive blessings from God. See, we do. We do things not to change God's heart toward us. We do things to change our heart towards God. <clears throat> what is our heart being changed? It's being turned on to who we are in the Spirit. For example, if you don't go to church, God still loves you. But you won't love God as much. Are you hearing the difference? God still loves you. And, and, and if you're, I'm talking about a church that's preaching the new covenant. Some of these churches, if, if, if they're preaching a mixture of law and grace, I guarantee you you're going to burn out instead of burn in. But, if, but hear me, if you don't go to church, God, it doesn't change God's heart towards you. But it will, if you go to church, it will change your heart towards God. And if you don't go to church, if you, I'm talking about hearing the new covenant. Can you hear that? Just like giving doesn't, you're already blessed. But if you believe it, you act upon it. My word, that's good stuff. So the, it cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now go back to our old friend, Romans chapter 5, verse 21. Praise God. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. Watch this. I talked about this last week. And I've entitled this message, In Order to Reign in Life, You Have to Assure Your Heart. In order to reign in life, you have to assure your heart. Now look at this. Just like sin reign, that word reign means like a king. You know, out in the world, sin reigns. You don't believe me? Look around. Right. Watch the news a little bit. Watch all the fighting and all the stuff that's going on in the world and people can't get along and, and, and there's, you know, all this diseases and just stuff going on and terrible things going on. You know what that is? That's sin reigning. All right. All right. This uh, tornado we experienced in Oklahoma. Do you know, hear me, and I'm going to say it. Do you know that the body of Christ has the authority to rebuke 
that tornado before it came. You know what's happening right now? Some of you are going, I don't know about that. You know what that is? That's your heart that's not assuring you that that's true. That's your heart condemning you. Say, I don't know about that. That's your heart condemning. I'm just showing it to you. That's your heart saying, well, I don't know. Even me, I'm thinking, wow. We have the authority. And all of creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God for us to stand up and take our authority that we have in Jesus' name. If that was not the case, Jesus rebuked a storm. Oh, that was Jesus. Jesus walked the earth. We talked about it last week. He was fully God, but he walked the earth as a man full of the grace of God. Although he was still God, nothing diminished from his deity. And he rebuked a storm. He was demonstrating how you and I can walk after we're born again. And we're just like the disciples were. They, they at least had a little bit of an excuse in the sense that they weren't born again at that time. But of course, Jesus rebuked them for their unbelief and no faith. In other words, they should have seen, but, but they, they were amazed. And that's how we are too. We think, oh man, that person seen, you know, rebuked a storm or, and, and, and it obeyed them. Wow, they must really be spiritual. No more spiritual than you are if you're born again. They just happen to know a little more. We've said it before. The difference between when Jesus walked the earth and you and I right now as born again Christians, the difference is Jesus knew who he was. We, he wants us to know who we are in him. It's not because of our greatness. It's because of his greatness. But see, our heart's condemning us because we're constantly making a big deal out of us. Oh. Come right back here. Jump over to, well, remember Romans chapter 8. Don't go there. Just stay there. Romans chapter 8, and, and, and I'm going to do verses 5 through 8 from the Message Bible. But first let me do this. So that as sin is reigned in death, even so grace, what is grace? Unmerited favor. It's a lot more than unmerited favor. A lot more than unmerited favor. Remember I gave you Thayer's definition last week. Grace is that divine influence upon the soul that does two things. Everybody say two things. Two things. It strengthens and it empowers. It strengthens and it empowers. Yes, it's unmerited favor, but it's a whole lot more than that. Grace is the divine influence upon your soul. And it does two things. It strengthens you and it empowers you. Now watch this. Just like death reigned, the sin reigned in, in death, even so grace, that divine influence. God's, you could say it like this in a simple, God's ability. It's ability. It's unmerited favor, but it's unmerited ability. This God's ability reigns through righteousness. What is righteousness? It's a heart that's no longer condemned. It's an assured heart. It's a position. And your heart's agreeing with that position that you have in Him. Your heart is now assured of what? That you're righteous. That you're righteous. How does grace or God's ability reign? It reigns through an assured heart. Assured of what? Assured that it is righteous in Him. That's why 1, John, or 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. The only key to sinning not, you've got to wake up to your righteousness in Him. What is that? That's a heart that's assured. That's a heart that's been sprinkled from an evil conscience. Sprinkled with what? The blood of Christ. That takes effort, people. See, people in the grace mindset think, Oh, I'm under grace. Praise God. I don't have to do it. I just kick back. No, you're righteous. I agree with that. There's a truth there. But listen, in order to believe it, it's a fight. That's called the good fight of faith. The good fight, it's of faith, not for faith. You're not fighting the devil. The devil's defeated. You're fighting wrong mindsets. What's the key to hear and hear and hear? and hear and meditate and hear and go to Bible studies and meditate. I'm talking about ones that are exalting the finished work of Christ. And no, we don't take up offerings at Bible studies. <laughs> so, that, so that a sin is reigned, just like sin reigned in death. Grace, God's ability, reigns through righteousness into, the Greek says, eternal life. What is eternal life? Knowing Him. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, an evil conscience is a conscience that makes a big deal out of you and not out of Jesus. Now go to Romans chapter 8, verse 5 from the Message Bible, please. Message, if I could have it from there. I like it. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle but never get around to exercising it in real life. 
Those who think it's their own power. What is that? It's an evil conscience. It's a, it's a, it's a heart that's condemning a person. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them. Living and breathing God. <laughs> I love that. Living and breathing God. Living and breathing God. I love that. Next verse. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Now, when we think of obsession with self, we think of, give me that toy. Give me that. It's mine. It's mine. And yes, that's obsession with self. But this obsession with self is obsession with, well, I just don't feel worthy. Do you know that's obsession with self? Well, I just don't. Well, you're not worthy in yourself, but he, you're not in yourself. He puts you in him. It's a heart that's not been assured by the blood of Jesus. That's obsession with self. Do you see it in a different light now? Religion causes you to be obsessed with yourself. That's why there's no joy with it. That's why there's no peace with it. That's why it's up and down and in and out. Well, we got to have another revival. Oh, we got to stir people up. They're running down again. Listen, have a relationship with God. Meditate the word of God. Get a manifestation of your righteousness in him. Pray in the Holy Ghost. That's what I said. Pray in the Holy Ghost a lot. And guess what? Nobody will have to stoke your fire. You'll live stoked up. You'll be fervent in spirit. You'll burn for Jesus. Oh, that's legalism, brother. That's not legalism. Discipline is not legalism. Discipline is actually responding to the divine influence upon your soul called grace. Once again, grace is not grace unless you respond to it. Mm -mm -mm. See, a lot of people, we mistake mercy for grace. Mercy is not getting the judgment we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. His ability, his power, his strength. Hear the difference? Big difference. Well, one guy said it best. He said, mercy's great, but walk in grace. <laughs> I mean, all right. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. I love that. Next verse. Focusing on self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God. Now stop for a minute. Anyone completely absorbed in self. Do you know what religion is? It causes me to completely be absorbed in my performance for God, whether good or bad. I lived many years as a Christian, born again, love God, but because of ignorance, I was obsessed with myself. I was obsessed with my fasting. I was obsessed with my praying. I was obsessed with my Bible study. I was obsessed with all the things that I was doing to impress God. Oh, I wouldn't say it that way, but that's what I was. And that's how religion will teach you that. It's, oh man, I'll tell you what, if, if you want to be blessed, then you've got to do what I did. And you've got to be obsessed with it. And you've got to be there every time the church doors open. And you've got to be there. Listen, God's more interested in why you do what you do than what you actually do. You need to hear the message of the new covenant, but God's not ticked off with you if you go on the lake one day. <laughs> Most pastors won't say that. You know why? Because it takes away their control power. I'm not trying to control you. You do what the Spirit of God's leading you to do. That's a whole lot greater than anything that people can. This is why people aren't excited about Jesus. Jesus is cool. He's not beating you down. The Holy Ghost isn't hanging out with you saying, Ah, you did it again. I've about had it with you one more time, but I'm your friend. I'm your comforter. How's that comforting you? I'm feeling the comfort, baby. I'm feeling the love. But that's how we preach him. We think that every time we're, oh man, I had a rotten thought and the Holy Ghost convicted me. That wasn't the Holy Ghost. That was your conscience. We all know right and wrong if you're born again. You know it, man. It's not rocket science. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to cuss that guy out. I just, I really, I didn't know that. You mean it's not cool to cuss? I thought it was. Wow. You know, I was thinking recently about uh, Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus commissioned his disciples, what I call the Great Commission mission. He says, go into the world, and I love this, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Oh, wait a minute here. You mean teaching them to keep the law of Moses? That's not what that's saying. I want to look at the commandments of God. You know there's commandments of God in the New Testament? But it's not like you think. It's not a commandment to be righteous. The command, I'll just tell them to you in 1 John chapter 3. Verses 22, 23, and 24. I'll just tell you, tell you to you quickly. The commandment, it says commandment singular is to believe on Jesus. 
That's the commandment. Amen. And, and then it says commandments, plural. Mm -hmm. To believe on him and to love your brother. They're all, everything's summed up in that. And that you can do that now because that's your nature. New Testament commandments are nothing more than empowerment. But in Matthew chapter 28, he says, go into all the world, make disciples and teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Teach them to observe the new covenant, not the old covenant. But you got people coming up and taking, well, I'm going to teach you how to keep the law of Moses. No one could ever do it. And you're not going to be. There. Jesus was the only one that ever did it. And he did it for us. And if you try to go back under that, you become antichrist. And the Bible says, cursed, Galatians 3.10, cursed, empowered to fail, fail, cursed is everyone who continues not in all things which are written in the, in the book of the law of Moses to do them. Everything. If you're going to approach God based on your merit, you're putting yourself back, back under a law and you walk under a curse if you don't keep everything. I'm going with Jesus. How about you? <laughs> it's, a, it's a better way to go because well I think I got them all the Bible says in James chapter 2 verse 10 if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point you're guilty of the whole thing you shoot a BB hole through that window or run a semi through it you've got to replace the whole thing it's ruined amen you keep everything see this is why it's such good news but you're going to have to assure your heart of that because your heart's going to automatically it's so natural to revert back to what you're doing we do it all the time well, and who has this mentality? Someday, when I get to that level, whatever that level is, we don't even know what it is. I do it too. Someday I'm going to be at this level. No, that level's right now. His name is Jesus, and he put you in him. He raised you up and seated you with him, seated you with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The only thing that keeps you from that is an evil conscience, a heart that's condemned, a heart that has not been assured of the blood of Jesus and what he did. And then when God looks at you as he is, so are you right now in this world. What part of that do you not understand? We got to get past mental ascent and start operating in who we are. Amen. Amen. See, most of what we call faith is nothing more than mental assent. We're just, oh, I agree with that, brother. I agree with that. Don't act on it, but I agree with it. No, it's, that's just the philosophy. That's all that is. Oh, this is good news. Focusing on self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed with self, oh, this is so good. Anybody completely absorbed in self ignores God. When you're focused on your own works and your own performance, guess who you're ignoring? Romans chapter 11 verse 6 says it's either grace or works, but it's no combination of the two. It's one or the other. Amen. You're either trusting Jesus or you're trusting you. You're either responding to the divine influence upon your soul called grace or you're under works to try to be righteous based on you. One or the other. Romans 11 6. That's what he's saying. See, that's what makes mixture so dangerous. See, because mixture's so subtle, you don't even realize it. And that's why you got to hear and hear and hear and hear, because I'm telling you, all the voices around you, the 1 Corinthians 14, 10 says there's many voices in the world. They're all telling you the opposite of what Jesus did. Every, every one of them. So anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God. He ends up thinking more about self than God. Do you know why we fear? We fear because of being absorbed in self. Fear is a result of self-trust. Perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4, 18. Perfect love, His love, will cast out fear. We fear is, fear is a manifestation that we're under a self-legalistic law focus. It's a manifestation that our heart hasn't been assured in Him. That's why we fear. What's the answer? Condemnation? No. Focusing on how much God loves you and how much he's not condemning you. If your heart condemns you, God's greater than your heart. He still loves you. But if you get to the place where your heart's not condemning you because of the blood of Christ, then you have confidence towards God. Then you know you're not going under, you're going over. Amen. Amen. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My word. Golly, I'm taking up an offering for myself. <laughs> it's a joke. Focus here. Look at this. I got to finish this. Anyone completely absorbed in self ends up thinking more about self than God. What is fear? It's a result of thinking about me. Amen. Think about it. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing. Or I would, I would say it this way. That person ignores who God is and what he's done. What he's already done. The finished work of Christ. 
The Message Bible is good, but it is a paraphrase and it's far from perfect. I will tell you that up front. Eugene Peterson had a good way of wording things, but I'm saying the better way to say that would be that person ignores who God is and what God has done. Why? Because he's so focused on self. Legalism will focus you on yourself. I, oh, I can't think of how many years as a Christian that I was so self-focused and I really love God. And I thought even in all my zeal, I thought, man, I'm just not zealous enough. It just can't seem to get to that level of, of zeal that, that, you know, Wigglesworth was at or who was ever at. It's one of my heroes. I just can't seem to get, but someday I'm going to get there. And I'm going to, that's, see, that's what makes people weird, <laughs> you know. I've never been weird, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> that person who's absorbed in himself, he ends up, he ignores God and what God has done. Next verse. And God isn't pleased at being ignored. <laughs> God, God doesn't like that. Because see, when you turn away, that's what the scripture talks about in John chapter 15, about abiding in him, about abiding in the vine. Oh, there's so many verses on the heart. So many verses on the heart. In fact, let me close with uh, a condemned heart. Will, I'm just going to give you this and I'll close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, and then we'll do Proverbs 18, 9 from the Old King James in Proverbs. But do 2 Corinthians 6, 1, please. You can do both of them, Old King James, if you want. A condemned heart will cause you, or a, a conscience that has not been sprinkled by the blood of Christ and not realize the redemptive work of Christ will be sin conscious instead of Christ conscious. You're either sin conscious or son conscious. That he is the son, but you're a son too because you're in him. But look at this. We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now stop. You can receive the grace of God and have no effect on your life. That's receiving it in vain. In other words, it doesn't do any good. Amen? And Paul said this, look at this. Paul said, as workers together with him, we're pleading with you. We're beseeching you. We're begging you. The only thing that causes a person to receive this divine influence or God's ability upon us in vain is a condemned heart. A, a conscience that's condemning us instead of telling us, go. See, and here again, if, you don't, if you're not constantly assuring your heart, you'll fall right back under that condemnation. You will. Now I'm going to give you a proverb. I got a whole bunch of proverbs from a new covenant mindset. In fact, I'm thinking about trying to write something on proverbs in light of the new covenant. Proverbs, verbs, watch this. This causes you, watch this. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9 from the old King James, please. Old King James. He who is slothful, old King James. I, I, that's okay, but I like, there's something I like. He also that is, thank you, that is slothful in his work his brother to him that is a great waster. Now, look at this. He, we always look at this, well, if you're lazy, you're wasting. And that's all true. I agree with that. I'm not disagreeing with that. But I saw a new angle on this. He also that is slothful in his work. Whose work? His work. His work. God's work. He also that is slothful in his work. What is, what is our part? Receiving. Understanding. Assuring our hearts. Right? Assuring our hearts. Assuring my heart. I can be lazy in assuring my heart about the blood of Jesus. Now watch this. He also that is slothful in, not my work, his work, his brother or kin to him that is a great waster. What is he doing? He's wasting the grace of God. He's not receiving the grace of God. He's only received in vain. It's not making a difference in his life. Amen? Are you blessed or what? Wow, you're blessed. See, we need to assure our hearts we need to assure our hearts that we're blessed because it's not based on us. It's not based on us. It's based on Him. Amen? Say it's based, it's based on Him. I'm healed because of Him. I'm blessed because of Him. In every area. Because of the blood of Jesus. Because of the blood of Jesus. I told you last week that uh, I just went, usually sometimes when I feel like I haven't been what I should be, I'll take communion because it reminds me that it's about Jesus. But last week for the first time I took communion just because I just felt like, why am I so blessed? I should feel guilty. You know, sometimes you almost feel guilty about being happy. Yeah. I mean, it's like you're just not being responsible, Emerson. You need to be, Dan, you need to be responsible and worry a little more. And you feel like, yeah, you're right, I should. I mean, what's wrong with me? Amen. 
But I said, I took communion to remind myself that anything, all goodness is from him. God is always good. And he's always got good for you. But it seems like a lot of Christians walk under a curse or they walk under where they're, it's because their hearts aren't assured. So, they, so what they do is they become obsessed with their self and obsessed with their performance rather than obsessed with what Jesus did. Exactly. Amen? And that's what it means to be consumed with yourself. Yeah. And the reason people exhibit lifestyles of, you know, me, 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 and I, and party, hearty, those are all what the Bible calls works of the flesh. They're all a byproduct of trusting in their self. So then because a person's empty, they run to the things of the world. And, and the word is suffocated by the cares of this world, the anxieties and worries of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. But it all starts with the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see the Lord. They'll see God manifest in every situation and circumstance in their life. Why? Because their hearts are pure. It's about what he did and not what they're doing. <clears throat> Amen. Praise God. I'm done.